podcast. On the podcast, you've heard me talk about a lot of things. You've heard me talk about DNA, methylation clocks, health, wellness. But we've we've explored the mind, but we haven't really taken a deep dive. And today, I've found you a super interesting guest. My guest on the show today is training to be a cognitive scientist. And if you ask me what is cognitive science, I might not be able to tell you exactly. And that's why I have him. And he's he's a friend. He's he's been I've been a part of his events. He has been for all of you Dubai people. He's been in Dubai and he's going to be coming to speak on the World Biohack Summit. So this is something that you guys should be looking at. He's um, done so many things. He is into mindfulness. He's a founder and um, mindfulness teacher at UC Berkeley. He does researches especially in an area which i am super interested in which is altered sciences uh, using ai and neuroscience physiological testing he does lots of stuff and he's on the other side he's also an advisor to web3 companies this is another thing that i do not know much about so we can ask him today if you guys are like me and you don't know he's been living in europe and not just europe he's traveled all over the world lived in so many different countries he's got a different perspective about human psychology and the way we interact with each other so let me introduce you to today's guest my friend and the guest on the show today mr kevin kevin welcome to the show yeah my habibi that's the yeah, my habibi <laughs> Best way I can so, Kevin, you've been like in so many places all around the world. Where are you currently? I'm in the Netherlands for a yeah. good uh, focus sprint, to focus on my research and get ready for other big moves. Okay, so let's let's jump right in. We've all heard about neuroscience. What is cognitive science? Well, neuroscience. Um, I can give you a primer of what neuroscience is as a foundation. Like I divide it into uh, neurochemistry. You know, you have neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, hormones, and so forth. And then you have uh, brain areas, the insula or uh, amygdala, hippocampus, and the uh, whole cascade that makes our cognitive architecture. Yeah, this uh, next has heard uh, sometimes because I often talk about this neurohormones and peptides and what area of the brain is lighting up like the amygdala or the prefrontal cortex. So all of this falls under neuroscience. Okay. Yeah. And, and also brain networks, you know, we have three main brain networks, which when we talk about specifically altered states later are quite intertwined. We have the default mode network, which is really to solve referential processing. Um, we would... <laughs> In, in research, consider this the big bad boy to understand our uh, neurosis and our psychopathologies and excessive thinking because um, this uh, mind wandering mode is because of this brain network and we're mostly thinking all the time because of this network. Then we also have the salience network to uh, distinguish different types of stimuli. Salient means novel stimuli, so it's a brain network that mediates the default mode network selects stimuli and the third network, which is the central executive network uh, related to all higher cognitive processes we do, like attention, working memory, long-term memory, and so forth. And then last but not least, we have neuro uh, electricity, as I call it. This is brain waves. Everybody knows which types of brain waves are there, what they do, what amplitude, frequency they abide by. The interesting part with brain waves is when we talk about altered states, for example, then monks or people who have a lot of experience with these practices are able to access brainwave states like theta and delta within minutes, which would take hours for a Western mind that is uh, focused on so many different areas. Yet neuroscience is a part of uh, cognitive science and cognitive science is uh, basically how the mind or brain represents and manipulates knowledge, right? And there's different areas within cognitive science, for example, linguistics, anthropology, psychology, neuroscience, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. 
Um, my own personal focus area has been within uh, machine learning now more and more because as we know, uh, AI and um, <laughs> let's say neural networks are taking over the world. If, if you're not in AI, you're out of business already, just saying, or out of research. And specifically founder performance and leadership performance and how can we quantify with the tools of neuroscience uh, how, let's say, for example, mindfulness or different types of states of consciousness can or cannot enhance uh, our executive functioning, executive functioning being like the, the highest potential a human has based on their uh, neurobiology, right? The, Every action we do is related to how potent our executive functioning is. And, you know, cognitive science is at, let's say, the, the frontier of discovering how, what works and what is validated. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. Now, you've, you've mentioned so many interesting things. Like, first thing I want to go on was those three neural networks. You mentioned the default mode network, the salience network, and the executive network, correct? Are these yes. all networks working simultaneously within each other? Or is it that, you know, you've got to have one network working first and then it's the order of importance? <laughs> well, that is called uh, global integration, uh, meaning, you know, we have two ways we can uh, distinguish the brain. There is functional connectivity and structural connectivity which is basically the same in neuroplasticity as well, which we'll talk about later. Um, functional is the communication between different functions. And structural is uh, communication between different um, areas in the brain. And there are these hubs, these globally integrated hubs, the three networks, as I mentioned. And they're never really not active. Right? I mean, the brain is never really not active. Because even when we sleep, there is very high levels of activity in the brain during REM sleep, for example, for you know memory um, consolidation and so forth. Yeah. Yet uh, we can we can kind of mediate their uh, activity with different practices, with altered state practices, um, or you know my my research has mostly been on mindfulness and sometimes psychedelics, even though that's not like my scientific background that much more. Background. So when you talk about the default mode network and you mentioned the big bad boy, what did you mean by that? What is, because I know that a lot of the default programming that we have or these repetitive thoughts, there is an, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there is a belief out there that we think anywhere between 60 to 70,000 thoughts in a day. And out of that, 90% of them are recycled. And those recycled thoughts then make us act in certain ways or shape our behaviors and personalities in a certain way. Is that what default mode network does? Hmm. Well, like there's many statistics thrown around and this is one example statistics, 50K, 60K thoughts, or when uh, we have specific repetitive thoughts that we try to attribute a number to it. It's always, as you know, as a biohacker, uh, dependent on so many variables. You know, when we talk about the brain specifically, there's like neurobiological variables. There's the four levels of variables that make individual differences based on, you know, the neurochemistry, the neuroelectricity, the ways the brain areas have developed and individual experiences. So it's never a set in stone, right? Um, so what I uh, have researched, for example, in Maastricht, where I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, is how we can you know, use machine learning, for example, to personalize uh, mindfulness practices. Practices um, That would um, you know, give more solid data, for example, on how um, these individual differences are correlated to real brain changes, mm -hmm. let's say for the default mode network. But like in general, it, it's a pretty statistic that it's not always mm, like that. It's, because I also, I also hear that after some experiences like, um, like psychedelic experiences or, you know, psychedelic journeys or ayahuasca journeys, one of the 
one of the reasons why everyone start looking looking at the world in a different way or like in a novel way is because there is some belief out there that the default mode network gets rebooted or resetted how, how much of, is this true or is this one of those things out there Well, how meditation, for example, works with the default mode network is that it helps to reduce this self-referential processing by developing metacognition okay. and meta, like a divide, uh, let's say meditation practices. There's so many different types of altered states, but let's stay with meditation into three. There is the metacognitive practice, which is just training your awareness. Um, or in, in the East, in the Sanskrit tradition, it's called Tiana, right? Meditation. Um, is that more on focus? Like, let's say you're, we hear about a lot of these apps saying that, uh, like Palm or mm -hmm. there are so mm -hmm. many out there and most of them, they'll tell you to focus on your breath. So all of your attention during meditation is either at focusing on your breath or there are some other sorts of meditation where they're focusing on a um, sound. So is that, does that fall under that specific category? I'm just saying this so people mm -hmm. who are listening to this, they can you know, relate to like a real world scenario on where they probably have switched on the app and then they've, the app has told them to either look in a certain direction or focus their mind in a certain way. So is that what you meant by Dhyana? Uh, I meant because before Dhyana, there's Taryana, right, which is the object meditation. We're talking about, you know, the Eastern perspective of concentration and the Samadhi state. But from the Western perspective, concentration is a separate practice for diff different brain regions. And that's what I've researched here as well, like how does you know, mindfulness concentration practice work with uh, cognitive performance for people in positions of leadership. And there's you know, positive associated correlations with uh, working memory and attention, but also more research is needed in long-term memory and cognitive flexibility. Um, so that's concentration. Then you have the emotional regulation practices um, or Buddhism. They're just, you know, the, the you know, metta and loving kindness meditation. So it's interesting to see how, you know, what we research in Western, even uh, cognitive science literature to see what happens uh, within these high, high level altered states is directly related to what we got from the East. And back to the default mode network topic. Uh, it helps to reduce activity, but it re doesn't really reboot. There's still a lot of things we don't know about how psychedelics work in the brain. You know, there's this abnormal serotonergic activity. There is uh, differences in cortical layering that happen. There are many uh, aspects uh, that uh, are still kind of mystery in terms of science, of like empirical science. But um, I'm also pretty sure that people from the East or the forefathers, the indigenous people and the yogis, uh, as well as individuals who have gone deeper into these layers, experientially know what's happening. But it's an experience. We cannot really quantify that, I feel, yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're With, true. Sometimes, it, and it's different for everyone, right? Like it, your experience is different to mine and then our experience is different to someone else's most of the time. So it's difficult for us to tell the audience, like, this is how you're going to feel. But I yeah, always right. encourage people, yeah. it's safe to do so. Make sure once in your life, at least, it doesn't <laughs> matter which religion you belong to, or just if you have a safe setting, then make sure you do try something like this because it's it could be powerful. Definitely. And... The, you know, the next level of using technology uh, for the same question you asked is to see exactly what happens in the default ne mode network and then use uh, neuroimaging to make different meditation practices. For example, you know, Buddha was the original meditation person from the East or different types of DTs or advanced meditators. Now, I think it was Shiva. Shiva was the first, and then Buddha just continued his legs. Like, so. Well, the rishis, the rishis and the siddhas, these are the OGs, right? Um, and then there's different layers of enlightened beings start to emerge, whatever that means from the perspective of science. And me being in Maastricht and talking about Buddha and the rishis, 
but some people understand because their um, perception has been changed by their own experiences and it's fine if you know people have uh, no direct experience of it or if they're only interested in the cognitive part of it it's different um, strokes for different folks yeah and um, also you know one of the things that i mentioned in the beginning of the podcast is that kevin has traveled all around the world and he's been to some of these eastern sites i think kevin you spent like a good time in india right you've traveled all over india you've met these these yogis, these rishi sort of a people, you have stayed with them. And how was that sort of an experience? And were you, when you were on that journey, were you still committed to exploring the cognitive side of things? Like, or is this something that came across after you made all of those trips in places like India specifically? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I believe I have like two paths. One path being the experiential, which I didn't even know that I was uh, being pulled towards until like seven years ago. Then I went to India. I lived there, learned about what a lot of people begin with Vipassana. Vipassana, uh, Vipassana quite a bit of times. Uh, tell us what and Vipassana And as you go deeper, you like, let's say if someone doesn't know what Vipassana is, uh, tell us what, give us a brief outlook. <laughs> I hope most people here just know what Vipassana is. But, but found foundationally, very basics, it is training uh, and purifying your mind and your body. With meditating for 10 hours a day for 10 days. And at the same time, you have specific... Um, let's say virtues that you develop as you do that practice, like loving kindness, concentration, wisdom, and you have, you know, a deeper dive into the human experience uh, based on a Buddhist psychology. For example, we have craving. We search for something. We crave for something consistently. Right? Maybe from the Western perspective, it's just a dopaminergic desire to chase. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, we have aversion. We don't want X, Y, Z to happen or ignorance. We are blind to the process of our own, <laughs> let's say, neurosis and overthinking, which a lot of people from the East don't have that much that I've noticed. A lot of people in India who I saw who don't have wealth or a lot of wealth, meaning physical wealth or intellectual wealth. But they're very present. That happen? Or why is what's the what's the thing that's keeping them so present? Or why haven't they fall in the trap of what maybe the Western society in terms of in geographical location has fallen into? Like, what's the hack? Or what, are they doing something special that we can all learn and then bring into our life? Because the biohacker in me is like, okay, if this group of population is doing. I mean, they are you know able to downregulate certain brain activities or like either like you know upregulate certain brain pathways then let's let's just see what they're doing and let's learn from them and maybe cognitive science is about this as well but yeah biohacking is the same thing yes and there are many overlaps right from, from the western and eastern perspective i am actually more pulled towards the eastern one even though i went into cognitive science as part of the, uh, the professional paths, right? As I mentioned, I had two paths. One is the experiential, learning about Vipassana, going deeper into staying in jungles and doing ceremonies with maestros in Peru. Um, I have met very few people who are like high on that level of experience because I believe as we travel in these places, how we are, we are accepted from the environment and accepted by the teachers as well. And I know I will go back to India to continue the work, but now the professional path is uh, much more lined up and I'm in a very much hyper-focused stage. So the professional path was, you know, initially I was in a business school and then I, I noticed that people, including myself, are not happy. And if you, if you do business, you should be happy and working with capital should be enjoyable. I mean, it is. Everybody deserves wealth. Mm -hmm. But if we become attached to it and it controls us, 
or if anything that does that to us, then that is um, dissociation. It's not a healthy. I think it's dissociation from our true selves. And you know, as I as I traveled, I saw that these practices have quite a bit of uh, need in the West. When I went back to homeland to to Estonia, I saw in the startup scene people were asking me, Kevin, you know, you've changed. I think I was like. That was five years ago or something. And um, I started to teach to a degree within startup environments. Then I thought, okay, I'm going to get more validation and work with uh, world-class teachers and uh, research institutions to understand the gist of it. So that's the professional path. But the experiential path is always uh, coming from the heart. It's a different calling than just doing cognitive stuff or working with money or whatever. We're doing research. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's it's so important to know that you know you've walked both of those paths, and everything that you're bringing, or everything that we're going to talk about, is supported by not just reading a book, but actually going and sitting with the person who's been talking about this maybe for years and years. But okay, so let's uh, let's move on. One thing that you mentioned earlier was altered states, and I think a lot of our audience would understand what's altered states but tell us what's your definition or yeah what's your definition of altered states it's quite interesting that mm, roughly one quarter of people are a little bit less than one quarter so one fourth fit into a state of flourishing and flourishing is a is a state from positive psychology that means that we are in a positive, elevated, happy, content, equanimous, joyous state versus languishing. Languishing uh, meaning that we are negative, we are sad, we are, we are letting our internal experience be controlled by external circumstances. And like within society and you know, social psychology statistics are always questionable, as I mentioned for this default mode uh, network. Uh, which is not social psychology, but still statistics. I always question them because of different variables and error rates. Um, but yeah, like one quarter of people are not, um, you know, below one quarter of the population uh, doesn't have a positive emotional state or have a, has a positive emotional state, like only one fourth or less. And, you know, I was wondering how, how much of it, it, it is our choice. So, and like in regards of altered states, uh, happiness can be a state of flourishing or a state of joy. And I'm actually going to ask you this. What do you think is the percentage mm -hmm. that deter determines our uh, happiness or our contentment based on three variables? Genes, our lifestyle choices, and life circumstances. What do you think is like the highest? I think it which one has the highest weight of those and why? Um, I think it would be your lifestyle choices because genes, we know that there are, there are some genes that encode for people having more of an addictive personality, the comp COMPT gene or the gene that uh, reduces naturally puts you at a lower level of dopamine. So, but that doesn't mm -hmm. affect so much into most people. The next two you mentioned was lifestyle choices. And the, what was the other one? One was lifestyle choices and... It's genes, yeah. and lifestyle choices, and life circumstances. Like what has happened to us? You know, the nurture part of us. I think the most strongest people on the planet or like people who have the ability to access this, like Martin Seligman says, the flourishing state or... You know, a lot of the Eastern people have been putting that state into the category of joy. Um, even when life circumstances get hard, that doesn't affect their ability to be joyful. Although a lot of people think that, you know, sometimes, you know, life circumstances are hard and the people who are more balanced and the people who are able to tap into those states of flourishing, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how you know, what kind of circumstances they're, they are always right in the center point and they're able to sort of, you know, shirk it off and go ahead. But I could be wrong. So I would say lifestyle choices because a bigger impact on brain health 
and mood and things like a little bit of negative things like depression could be your the amount of time that you're sitting or standing or moving so movement is a big one then the kind of foods that you eat like seed oils or some other inflammatory foods they will or high amounts of sugar they will mess up your brain so that if you don't sleep enough i always say sleep is a bridge between hope and despair so if you want to live a hopeful yeah. future right then you know you get more sleep and if you want to live a disparity which is a negative emotion then get less of sleep so i think i mean i don't want to go off on another tangent but i think that lifestyle choices can impact people more than everything else but tell me what's what's right <laughs> you nailed it man um <laughs> Well, genes is roughly 10 to 15, and then mm -hmm. uh, life circumstance is like 35 to 40, and the rest or the majority is, uh, is our choices. And, you know, when we talk about altered states, which are, um, do you want to say something? You were no, thinking. I was, I was just like, yeah. And, and thank you for <laughs> sharing that and giving that example, because some of these lifestyle choices are so simple to make. Like, you know, that's what we want to, like, try to get to people that, it's not your genes and it's not your mother and it's not your father. It's just like how you live your life moment to moment to moment. Like, you know, you've been sitting for a long time. Oh, go get a walk. Actually, I wanted to just share this. Um, this is something I got to know recently that there is a step count threshold mm -hmm. above which it's very, very hard for you to be like, uh, get mood disorders or I wouldn't say depressed, but like it lowers down your chances of, getting depressed and that step count threshold is at 5,469 steps. So if you're able to move 5,469 steps at a minimum in the day, it's just more blood flow to the brain, more nutrients to the brain, more oxygen in your body. And, you know, all these other things they get, it doesn't happen. Or yes. yeah. yeah. So yeah, go on. Sorry. Uh, this is something I remembered. So yeah, they start cascading and that's, you know, Compound interest doesn't only work well in business or leverage doesn't only work well with startups or all of these uh, processes, I don't know, autom automation, um, uh, delegation, uh, removing aspects that are not serving the, purpose, the, the higher purpose of the system. Um, they're so intertwined to how we manage our biology and uh, mental health as it is even in business. So there's a lot of overlap. And um, so for, for altered states, my own interest has of course been because of my experience and um, my interest in mental health and how, you know, what, what's happening in the attic uh, shapes or shifts our uh, states and traits. And I'll talk about states and traits later because we have like I, I think in terms of East and West consistently because we have lots to learn from both perspectives. You know, you're, you're from India, you're in Dubai, I'm from Estonia, I'm in the Netherlands, I've lived in a lot of places and all of these personalities and uh, uh, let's say energies have become a part of me. So I should know how they function. And, you know, when, when our normal state of consciousness changes, and that is an altered state. So there are so many different practices i'll say some that i think are unconventional because everybody knows meditation everybody knows breath work everybody knows uh, these main ones that are uh, on, the, on the on the forefront and becoming more widely used but have been used probably for thousands of years already in the east uh, well basically the west has this notion of a trait a trait can be it's a quantifiable or isolated uh, or a psychometric uh, attribute that we have it's a mental faculty or a personality trait right and we can measure them we can use science to quantify them or advanced methodologies like neuromodulation or brain computer interfaces etc in the east we have state uh, it's nice that you earlier mentioned the state of joy so you you, you know your stuff that's good to hear and and the state is where you are in a continuing, continuous experiential feeling of your practice or your environment versus thinking about it or isolating or doing the cognitive arithmetic. 
most of this thing I learned from um, Dr. Daniel Brown, who also has done like decades of research in Harvard about um, psychiatry and Buddhist psychology and Tibetan Buddhist psychology. Um, and while it really depends on our intention, right? If we have shamans from the from the jungle, their intention is not to heal some psychopathology. Or if you have yogis, their intention is not to um, develop or concentration to be better entrepreneurs or high performers. But we we need to take both into consideration as we explore also the pitfalls of uh, altered state. It's um, with, with this guy. I feel um, some non-known altered states, for example, are the heart space. We have heart math and heart coherence and heart intelligence and all of these concepts that are quite not validated, of course, because we don't have the neuroimaging or the brain imaging. Um, well, we have those tools, neuroimaging and brain imaging, but how do we measure uh, the electromagnetic field that comes from the heart and how do we quantify that? as something that provides a change. So that's one altered state. Also, we can have emotional altered states, like when we use positive psychology interventions, it uh, definitely changes, this is more quantifiable, it changes reward processing areas in the brain, like the ventral stratum and uh, different brain for prefrontal cortex areas. Um, everybody knows about psychedelics, and how psychedelics work, um, I already mentioned a bit, uh, yet it's neuromodulation and uh, functional connectivity and how perception, emotion, and thalamus and default mode network areas are changed. A, so, it, uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, uh, interesting areas I'd just add is uh, using darkness. You know, I've heard of these people who go into the dark, they stay in the dark for seven to 10 days. I have not researched this, but it's for an altered state, also flow and performance states for traveling, because when you travel, novelty uh, and unpredictability uh, change your neural networks. Also, um, shamanism and tribalism, <laughs> very, very ancient practices, of course, and you know, silva and transurfing, Vision uses silva, transurfing is a methodology that works on the very uh, very fine level of uh, energy movements within the brain. So we can change our states, right? There's the physiological changes that happen when we do altered state practice, and then there's the mental changes that happen. That, that's the that's where the magic happens. That's where, how do you change your health? How do you change your mind in a way that you don't only focus on the past or the negative aspect? It, it is a change of consciousness. It's very interesting how this mental change can happen. So tell us, how do we get to these states? Like, what's your hack? How do you get to this heart coherent state? Is there a, have you discovered something or has science discovered something? on um, getting to this heart coherence or some of these other methodologies. I mean, not just the shamanism because you can go find a shaman and he can, he can do a ceremony with you. But like for people who are listening, is there anything like that they can use and start doing today, which is not meditation and which is not some of these other things? Is, it, is there something, something that you're experimenting with? How do you try to bring your you know, heart balance in? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> Having a lot of different types of trainings, and there are so many different types of trainings. Some are validated, some are super validated, others are completely not validated. Hmm. One of the, the fascinating things about uh, researching either neuroscience or based on mindfulness or cognitive science, uh, for mindfulness is that A, you can use machine learning to uh, experiment with what types of practices fit an individual or a group, and you can develop new methodologies. You can combine them, right, with the use of brain imaging and so forth. 
So for, for me, what I've been experimenting with and also what I've been um, building with Altered Minds, the company I've been building, is what are the fastest ways to tap into different states? Like what's the five minute to 10 minute initiation into your desired state? And there's different types of states. It can be it can be a flow state or it can be a, um, a state of well-being. Or it can be a purification practice of how how do you purify your mind from from the muck as fast as possible. Um, we're still doing some R and D on what is the best practice for which specific category. But what I've been using mostly for my own practice is Vedanta, Vedic Vedic science and yogic science practices as they have the biggest resonance of what I feel. There are you share one of them with us? Sorry? Can you share one of them with us? Like what kind of Vedic or yogic practice are you using? Uh, do you know Atma uh, Um No, but I would love to find out. And I'm sure the audience would love to find out too. <laughs> so it's funny to categorize mindfulness practices as we did before. Concentration, metacognition, emotion, regulation. And Vedanta or Vedic science is a very, very big topic. And I'm not from India and I don't mm -hmm. speak Sanskrit, but I've done practices and I've stayed, you know, for example, Ramana Maharshi's ashram and different ashrams in South India to practice. And Atma Vichara is just self inquiry. It's a very powerful practice of go, going to different stages to identify the self. For example, we start with questioning, uh, who am I, right? who am I? It's a very simple question. It's like a mantra. And next is, who is this body? Who is these emotions? Who is these thoughts? Who am I? And then you go through a sequential uh, motion to who is asking the question that awareness that is behind the questioner. Because in Vedanta, you have three aspects that merge. There is the one that perceives, I perceive you, I'm talking to you. Then that is you are that which is being perceived. And then there is the act of perceiving, perception. And in Vedanta, with practice, we go behind all of these three and understand they are merged as one. These are advanced practices. For me, this has had the greatest resonance and it takes time and it takes sitting. It takes diligence. Yet it is ultimately, you know, with any altered state or any spiritual practice, validated or non-validated, we get to a stage where everything is that which we seek. When everything is connected to the higher consciousness where we just download things when we need to download. We can be in high performance when we need to. We can be in a state of ease when we need to because we have, with our practice or the blessings of our teachers, have opened different paths into becoming present. And Vedanta is one of the deepest ways to go there. It's like, it's like the advanced practices of Zen equals similar to Vedanta because there's just in Zen, you have emptiness and total awareness of that emptiness, and then you become that emptiness. Interesting. And when you speak about machine learning and AI, now one of the biggest examples of AI that I can think about is ChatGPT. So for people who are familiar, I recently, believe it or not, I did not even understand what ChatGPT was until it just started popping up everywhere and everyone was like, hey, you've got to use it. It's like magic. So. <clears throat> Here's a classic example of an AI, um, it, which is able to do like thousands of hours of work that a normal human being would use in multiple dimensions, and it makes your life easy. So, so when you're saying cognitive sciences and brain imaging, are we there yet where we can take some brain scans or see how you know some of the brain waves are floating? And then use some sort of like an AI to help us create or like 
find a pattern or like, can we just use these numbers and the AI can tell us, oh, you know what? You've got a trauma on the right side of your head or you've got a trauma when you were a kid and you've, you've got to figure that out first if you wanted to accelerate mm -hmm. your peak performance. Are we there yet or is this something that might be there in the future? <laughs> My mind is going through so many different answer categories. <laughs> I would say, number one, you know, chat GBT is layer zero. Layer one uh, being when, you know, different types of uh, niches or demographics like healthcare or quantum computing or neuroscience or um, biohacking or construction, whatever the niche is going to be incorporated with AI with machine learning, with natural language processing models or reinforcement learning and different uh, neural network models. Layer, layer two is when it's going to be super mainstream and everybody is going to be using layer one products. It's the same with blockchain, you know, Bitcoin being layer layer zero and Polkadot and other providers being layer one. Um, but for, for your question, um, you know, there are examples already of I'll give you two examples. One example is when you can use uh, brain-computer interfaces and uh, you know, there's brain-computer interfaces that are put into a person's skull, invasive methodologies to get neural signals that are decoded back into a computer and human-machine interfaces that manage this process and also provide neurofeedback for the brain to learn. You know, you saw these videos of Neuralink and monkeys playing pong with their yep. minds. But now we can also do that for speech and we're developing like, not me, but in general, what's like the advancements. In Maastricht, we use PCIs, but I'm not sure that they do it here. But I know you can do speech, um, the neural coding to uh, speech ready. So, um, and that is used with, within machine learning as well, right? If you can Im implement that in neuroscience research or uh, psychopharmaceuticals when they I just use the whole database of psychopharmaceutical research to find um, novel combinations of pharmaceuticals to treat different problems like cancer. And this is definitely going to happen within um, within neuroscience to develop or cognitive science to develop and novel solutions to novel problems because as AI advances, we will have more problems and we will have new jobs. And of course, the, mm -hmm. the, fear, the fear mongering of people is okay, we're gonna get fired. And I mean, just keep we need to keep up with the times and we need to stay focused on the future because I, I know both spectrums of people who are highly future, like they're futurists, they're focused on future, they're focused on. Um, enhancing their longevity, they're focused on being an outlier in their specific domain of uh, futurism. And then there's people who are stuck in the past. Um, we, we can, of course, fall to both spectrums, yet I would rather be in the future. Mm -hmm. And what's your advice for someone who is, um, you know, AI and, you know, you're in a, a very advanced part of Europe, Netherlands and Estonia by itself is super advanced. I am in a relatively advanced part of the world, but there are other areas in the world where people, A, it's not advanced, and B, they don't have the facilities and, and you know, AI is not even, or maybe AI is somewhere there, but mm -hmm. a lot of people have this mindset where they're thinking they're going to go on a job every day. And, you know, the, it's exactly similar to what you said, uh, this, they're living in the past. So what, are the like what what are the challenges or what are the advice that you can give them to kind of like take a step from the past to the present to the future and sort of be aligned with it because a lot of people who are in universities right now they have this same question they're like will ai take our jobs like what should we study we don't even know so for the youth of this world what's your advice because you you can you're a futurist yourself you're and you're in cognitive science you're looking at the research what kind of jobs should people look for or is there a certain skill set that people can start developing from today to be better ready for tomorrow 
big questions, my man, big questions. <laughs> I think <laughs> um, I want to put you on to this thing, but I'm just thinking about so many people out there who, I mean, I would, if I had to study in a university right now, man, I would have some sort of an anxiety because like, what, what am I studying for with this whole chat GPT now that I understand it a little bit better and I see its potential? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, mm. I'm happy about it, but it's just, you know, your mind bounces off both the scenarios. So if someone who's young and listening to this or someone who's confused on what they should be doing, I mean, should they just go and learn AI so that they can manage the AI systems later? <laughs> The, the magic of startups that make no code solutions, my man, is definitely an understatement. So I believe um, there are the, I mean, ChatGPT is a no code solution for a huge uh, natural language processing model. Uh, and if we have these no code solutions, and you can have code solutions as well, of course, you know, with Python or different languages. Um, or within TensorFlow to create your own models. But it really depends on, you mentioned the demographic and the um, culture, for example. So let's say you and me, we have access to these tools. And in places where there's war, or places where there's poverty, or places where there's um, not the blessings that we have been given, uh, very grateful for the blessings we have in life. and. Everybody in our lives, I'm always grateful for that. Uh, there's two ways. One is top to bottom and other is bottom uh, to up. Because people who have leverage, people who have capital, people who have influence, uh, it is up to them. It is up to people who can impact their local environments to provide these tools. Like, let's say, some parts of the Middle East or some parts in South America or some parts in Africa or some parts in Asia. Uh, and that fundamentally, from my perspective, is a change in heart and mind. And heart is more difficult. Well, both are difficult, yet for heart, hmm, what has worked for me is working with altered states, you know, um, doing meditation, doing medicine work, and always. Um, even when I fall for my ego or bypassing or all the pitfalls that can come from any uh, practice, I try to just connect back to my heart and know like, what am I doing? Does it have the highest uh, of benefit to people around me? And, and this, if a lot of people would do that in these specific uh, cultures and regions, that would have a massive top to bottom effect. Bottom up is of course how society adapts to these specific technologies. And uh, that takes training, that takes, um, um, you mentioned what can now, let's say students do for that. Mm -hmm. They can learn the art of using AI, no code solutions. How to use specific prompts, how to use AI in building a company or, I mean, it's so easy. I made a stack for myself of 20 AI tools. And I have these like in design, in business, in research, in whatever, um, not because I want the information I get from the machine, let's say, to be fabricated, but it's because our time is limited. And, you know, there's four types of leverage that uh, Naval Ravinkan talks about, right? We have, we have labor, we have capital, those are all forms of leverage. Labor meaning you work with people. I don't like the word. I don't like the word labor, but it's let's just say working with people because that has a network effect. Then we have capital to invest or uh, to put passive income streams to get more leverage with your capital. And then you have product and media, right? You build products that have um, hopefully an in, uh, an infinite sum game. So like ed tech products, for example, are cheap and easy to scale, easy to scale and distribute. Uh, and then you have media, right? Talking on a podcast or doing presentations and whatnot that will uh, have a network effect. So I believe these forms of uh, leverage should be incorporated into training people who uh, are going 
from the lower, let's say, rungs of society, or for people who are just in uh, in university or getting started with their lives, because yeah, fundamentally the world will change very fast, and we need to adapt to that with uh, understanding at least no code solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And if you guys are worried about the future, then you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get prepared. Um, one other thing that I was talking to someone this morning, and since we're on this topic, are you scared that there could be a time when AI is enabled to make its own decision making? Have you? Do you remember seeing the movie Terminator? Yeah. yeah. Do you think sure. we might run into something like this? Or is there a possibility of running into something? I mean, not at a large scale, but even at a smaller scale when we equip AI to just be by itself and make all the calling all the shots. I have no idea, man. There's the AGI or the general artificial intelligence. Hmm. Uh, forecasts and, you know, Ray Cartsville and... Uh, Peter Diamandis and all of these futurists, they have their own insights into what's going to happen. I think for me, I would just need to be focused on what I need to do. And if it happens, it happens. Yeah. And then we'll we cannot, we can, like technology is going exponentially, either via Moore's law or um, <laughs> just the emergence of new solutions from the technological landscape is so fast that we we cannot keep up with all of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, another thing that I wanted to check with you is um, we spoke about altered states and consciousness. Now, there will be a big part of the population that it has not maybe listened to this podcast and these guys haven't been able to you know, meditate or they don't think about consciousness in that way. What's the easiest way for us to sort of like talk to these people and make them understand that, you know, about the oneness and the wholeness and some of the topics that you've been talking about, or how do we get their minds to perform at that level? Like, let's say, for example, someone who's listening to this podcast and says that, hey, what Kevin said made sense. And I'm going to go try this on my brother. I'm going to tell them this information, but the brother doesn't care. And uh, how does this person go and convince their brother to like look into something like this? Hmm. I would I would relate that to neuroplasticity, right? Uh, so we can yeah we have we didn't even touch neuroplasticity. Please before you start, like just tell us what neuroplasticity is, and then you can continue. Yeah, so there's a lot of myths on neuroplasticity, uh, for example, that when there's damage to the brain, it cannot be repaired or it only appears in certain brain regions, as well as that age equals death to our brain. Another interesting one that I stumbled across is that neuroplasticity can be maladaptive, right? The, the, the Hebbian learning uh, quote of, Put fires together, uh, wires together, or what wires together, fires together, it works both ways. Um, so, it, you know, even if we do bad stuff to our brain, it, it sticks. That's also a form of neuroplasticity. And I'll tell you, you know, the foundations of how you induce neuroplasticity, so you understand more. But, you know, it's basically macro, which is structural, again, uh, which is neurons, uh, connections, and, and, and functional, which is communication between those. Uh, that's the macro overview, and the micro is you know long-term potentiation, long-term depression, synaptogenesis, and all of these terms to just you know get them out of our vocabulary. If you know you want to clarify these more, you can let me know. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, uh, you know, in, in the biohacking scene, there's a lot of these physiological and supplementation-based uh, biohacks. But for me. I've been interested in the cognitive and affective or emotional biohacks, right? And to see how, how, how it all starts from the mind, how, how the change that we have on the neural level equates the change we have on the external level. 
So I've um, done my research and have devised kind of a blueprint for myself, mm -hmm. which is seven uh, regular steps to uh, optimize or induce neuroplasticity and four more advanced ones. More advanced because they don't fall so much into your regular lifestyle, but you can start stacking them up. Right. Tell us about the seven nights. I think uh, that would be very interesting for the audience to know. Maybe they can take home a few of these and then try doing it today. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so when we so just took a sip of water, but basically, when you uh, think it from the cognitive perspective and the foundations of the isolated traits, as we discussed earlier, are important. So number one, you have alertness. You need to be alert. You need to have uh, acetylcholine neuromodulation uh, from the central executive network, right? Because that the neuromodulator, acetylcholine, will give you capacity to learn, right? Number one is alertness. Number two is attention, right? That is related to dopamine. And when we do context switching or switching our focus, and that induces, not induces, but inhibits our ability to tap into flow or any uh, neural change. So number two is attention. Number three is we shouldn't have any distractions or we should train our mind not to be distracted. It's called executive inhibition. That's for obvious reasons, so no distractions. Number four, expect and welcome errors because we are, we are compounding uh, resilience factors by uh, welcoming these errors uh, intentionally. And then we have accept frustration, right? We need to have um, the grit and resilience to hold ourselves present when things don't go as we prefer. Uh, don't walk away. That's the sixth one. That's also really the grit. Grit is our capacity to hold our focus and steadiness within any task. The last one is the foundation, the biggest therapist that we have in our lifetime, which is sleep. We really need to optimize sleep as, uh, you know, during REM sleep, memory consolidation and uh, synaptogenesis happens. So these are the seven ones, like alertness, attention, no distractions, expect and welcome errors, accept frustration, don't walk away, and optimize your sleep the foundations of inducing neuroplasticity. Uh, and I would add these other ones as well, because they're quite important. Uh, for example, play, you know, novelty, mm. non-predictability, which can be induced by, uh, for example, traveling or meeting new cool people in Dubai or in India or wherever you go, or nature. Nature is also one of the big, the big therapists out there, I would say. And then you have, Topamine scheduling, because basic form is that you schedule how much dopamine you release during your activities. More advanced is that you link it to errors. You yeah. have, because you know, it's related to this uh, expect and welcome errors as we had the fourth one. Because when you link uh, dopamine scheduling with errors, you automatically condition your mind to go more towards these uh, errors. It's like stress regulation or developing um, ways to being anti-fragile, right? Anti-fragile meaning that when stress hits you, you become more strong. You know, there's biological and um, even technological systems that become stronger as they get hit. Next one is intermittent rewards. So you schedule your topamine again. And then learning to rest, do your meditation, learn to calm down your mind. And that's halas. This dopamine scheduling, can you give us an example of this? Because this is something that is so interesting. Like what would be a typical dopamine scheduling in your day? <laughs> I don't do it every day. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the daily things you can do. Mm -hmm. like, the, the small micro dopamine uh, scheduling uh, practices, again, like meditation, 
going for a walk, getting out of your EMF zone, uh, having novel experiences. But the more validated framework for that is that you need at least a month to be away from a specific stimuli. And how do you isolate them or compound them from the uh, neuropsychology or cognitive science literature is much more difficult. So if you have Vipassana, for example, this 10 days of silence, 10 days of no phone, no talking, no writing, no reading, everything is totally uh, tabula rasa or blackout. Now, that is not even enough. That is 10 days. But imagine if you would do 30 days of continuous meditation like that. Go crazy. Like, I mean, you go, Vipassana you go by through. itself, it's <laughs> such a... Kevin makes it sound easy, but guys, whoever is listening, is Vipassana is one hell of a deal like your mindset has to be so strong to sit upright for 10 hours a day and not look into people's eyes you're not able to take a pen or a book you're only just there with your thoughts and then you might think that you can think of a lot of things in the world uh, or you might run out of thinking but man vipassana i've only heard from people like i personally want to go but i'm not sure if I can really do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jello, eh? challenging. <laughs> so yeah, it's it, these are some difficult practices. But like, for example, Kevin, I wanted to ask you. I personally, do, when I am a part of like events or if I'm part of like some projects that I need my focus and attention on, some of the things that I like to do is, um, for example, like social media. I only will check my social media after I've come home from work and that the max time is about 10 to 15 minutes. So is this mm -hmm. mean scheduling in any way? Yeah, sure. Well, th there's also a lot of misconceptions about dopamine. Yet, fundamentally, some say this dopamine fast is it's, it's, it's BS. It doesn't work mm -hmm. because the dopaminergic circuits... Uh, D1, D2, they're already made, and there's very like little room for error. And others say uh, it has a compounding effect, uh, you know, because if you look into clinical research into addiction or uh, trauma, well, not trauma, trauma is a different topic, but just um, addiction, then there is a threshold that uh, works with specific compounds or behaviors or thoughts or emotions under which they start to lessen in strength. Um, so I, I do believe it is a valid way of um, scheduling your dopamine, but I'm always, you know, have this critical thinking, um, nagging in, in my head and asking the questions of, okay, like what's the, what's the carryover effect or what's the, what are the limitations of that? Yeah, dopamine is so interesting because, you know, like Kevin mentioned, it one of the things it does in the brain is motivates you. It's responsible for pleasure, the drive. But also, I think dopamine can be a very big anti-aging hack. And as people age, their levels of dopamine start, I mean, these days, even younger kids, if they're constantly exposed to likes and social media and shout outs and all of those things it does play with their dopamine levels but as we age our dopamine levels are constantly um, or not constantly but they do decrease and i think one of the hacks that you can do to bring up that reward circuitry or bring that pleasure circuitry or bring that sort of novel circuitry that you mentioned earlier is to boost your dopamine levels and now some people like i mentioned they have a genetic variant that doesn't allow them to increase dopamine and i would be so curious i know about i blank out on the name right now but there are certain natural and certain pharmaceutical drugs that can elevate dopamine in the brain but again for me i don't have that critical thinking like you for me i just feel like okay if it's going to do it let's do it so <laughs> yeah we need people like you to keep people like us safe so thank you for that and um yeah, we're, you know, we've been talking so much about brain and altered states. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. Now, uh, to end this interview, something like really quick. What's your, like, if I had to do like a fast fa forward round with you, then tell me, how do you manage 
anger. Like, let's go through a few emotions that could be in the whole body, but it could, I mean, a lot of people think anger is in your brain. So like, when you get angry, what do you do? Mm-hmm. What's, what have you learned or like, you know, traveling or <laughs> your sound? I lash out and become a child. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know, like being on that spectrum of, I don't know, Buddha, and then being totally lacking emotional regulation skills. And I think, you know, humor is a, is, is a good way to observe anger, right? You know, anger has a dimension to it. Every emotion has a dimension to it. When we talk about mindfulness literature, we have mindfulness of emotions. And emotions have a arising, uh, maintenance, and disappearing effect to them. And in affective neuroscience, which is the neuroscience of emotions, there's roughly 1.5 minutes that a emotion lasts in our body. And emotions arise in the body. So let's say anger arises. It's like we have this, uh, we have this window of how anger stays that's number one number two is there are primary and secondary emotions we think okay our mind says this is anger or we feel this is anger which is not always easy to distinguish then secondary emotions can be underlying emotions when you have anger maybe that actually signifies that you're not feeling worthy or you're feeling neglected or you're not feeling connected to yourself or to others there's so many ways that um, how we have been raised influences how we are now mm-hmm. and the emotions that we have. So that's like the back end of it, the front end of me. Um, I can bring you an example if you okay. want. Like when I, you know, I, I think it was my fourth or fifth vipassana, and I had this immense anger come out of me. And that, of course, later turned into sadness uh, because it was related to maybe my lineage, maybe my home, maybe uh, some transpersonal stuff that we don't even know about so that's where you know we have transpersonal psychology that just maps out ways that we don't even know what's happening around us or inside us but there was this immense anger and then i i experienced it and i lived through it and it was intense and then it it faded and it was a form of release of a specific association i had from the past and, you know, as, as we go deeper within these practices or altered states, more of them start to get dissolved and dissolved, like sadness, anger, um, to uh, reach a more high level of awareness, to know, for example, if I am angry at somebody, I am angry at myself, or if I'm jealous, or whatever the emotional state is, uh, I can have a shift in that. I can turn my anger into compassion. I can turn my sadness into loving kindness. I can turn any type of emotion around by the switch of awareness. And I think I've learned that a lot. And that is, of course, a compounding effect to teach mindfulness and to research it. Yet most importantly, the effect is in who I am, with who, and what do I do? They say like the the hardest type of yoga is yoga of relationships. And, you know, you think you're so uh, advanced, go and stay with your family for two weeks and you'll see all the the things pop up again. That is where real change starts to happen. And, you know, that has been reflected back by other people as well who say, dude, you've got a really nice heart and, you know, you have a specific energy. I'm like, okay, thank you. And it's been a lot of work to work with states. And Admittedly. can you tell us again what was that 1.5 minutes? So was that that an emotional state can be at a peak for 1.5 minutes and then it starts moving away? Or yeah, if you want to learn more about um, emotional states, then Paul Ekman, who is the forefather of uh, researching emotions with neuroscience. He has mapped out, you know, the emotional atlas and different types of emotional um, states that uh, are foundational emotions and how they go. It's like colors, right? There's mm-hmm. three main colors, but these colors make the whole uh, multiverse of colors. And um, 
the foundations of this 1.5 minutes is when an emotion arises via an external or an internal stimuli, mm-hmm. let's say a change in temperature or a change in thought, then and there is a curve, right? A curve that arises, is maintained, and drops. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's, it's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think one of the things that people who are listening to this can take away that sometimes life throws lemons at you and maybe your father is throwing that lemon or someone else is throwing that lemon. But you get super angry and you just want to get your anger out. But after listening to this conversation and I'm going to try to do it, maybe Mm -hmm. let's just wait for some time. Let's just take... You know, instead of saying something mean or, you know, punching the person in the face, because at this point you're so angry and you're so narrow focus. And that's the only you're or like how Kevin would like to say the amygdala has like lighted up. But, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the thing is that in real life, things like these do happen. And if you can sort of do this experiment and you can share it with us on the comment section or, you know, message me or Kevin straight up and. Tell us, like, how did it work for you? Let, let's try, let's all try this experiment. Let's try to keep ourselves calm mm-hmm. for one and a half minute. And let's see if that emotion goes down and maybe we're in a better, you know, maybe we start having a little bit of compassion for the person. Maybe we start understanding that why that person threw that lemon on you. Like, you know, it's, mm-hmm. Kevin is, like, the way he's explaining it, it's it's all about, understanding and awareness and i think everyone has the ability to do it you don't have to sort of be trained in neuroscience you can develop these things but this is a really cool hack kevin just now i'm going to tell everyone this like just wait for a minute and a half and see what happens it's easier to control yeah. it for a minute and a half and then you know still save yeah. your life yes yeah it's, it's easier to do that and it's like the The basic of it is just being aware, just being aware and seeing what arises and not reacting to it. I would add there's, you know, one is doing that, seeing an emotion arise and then not reacting to it. Yet in other lineages like Kriya Yoga, there's uh, the emotion arising and then you use a statement to release that emotion. For me, the Kriya Yoga path has not been that deep, but more in the mindfulness space. So it's... Again, what individual, what works for everybody? What kind yeah. of statement do you remember? Anything from your teachers? Like, is there? I mean, it doesn't have well, to be Hindi, but like, you just give us an explanation on. You just you just uh, make a statement with, um, like, with, I, with, with the, the with, with, with the legend that this emotion will not stay here, or you will go, or you will leave the emotion. Uh huh. Um, so you address the emotion. Okay. Yeah, but you use your cognition for that. So it's not, that's why it hasn't really uh, stayed with me because, you know, in Vedanta, there's not that much of using the mind. So I get like when you use the mind to make a statement to clear out emotions, it's a form of purification. But just, you know, my intuition has been with mindfulness and different altered states. Well, I mean, thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Thank you for coming on the podcast talking to us it's been my pleasure and um you know i can't wait to see you in dubai for people who are listening in dubai kevin is looking at ways to spend more time here so if you want to catch up with him if you want to talk to him about some of the other things that we didn't even get time to talk about which is his whole advisory thing for you know this web3 companies and his altered minds company and his ongoing research and his speaking abilities and there's so much and so much more but you know where to catch him the world biohack summit when it's here in dubai and he's going to be here so kevin my friend thank you so much i am grateful that i got to know you and we are friends and thanks for all the good work you're doing and i can't wait to see what you come up with in the future with all of your researches and maybe you find the answers to the most longing questions because as a podcaster and a biohacker, I can assure you that I'm going to keep sending you those questions to solve. Yeah, we're connected, man. Yalla, Habibi. Yalla. Definitely enjoy this. And uh, CJ is, uh, is an amazing human being, the big hearts and the sharp mind. And we'll see you soon.
I uh, before you go, if people want to find you, what's the best way to find you? Social media or alterminds.org. Um, yeah, there's many. You can just connect with me on LinkedIn. There's all the stuff I'm doing. And Instagram. How do you spell your last name? Kevin Warren. <laughs> V-A-R-E-N. Casual yeah, historian. You know, I wanted to introduce him in the beginning of the podcast, but then I, I said maybe I'm going to... I don't know how to pronounce his name right, so I stick to Kevin, but now you know it's Kevin Varen. Uh, Just, I mean, you call me Mr. Kevin, so it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but anyway, um, Kevin, I'll thank you so much and uh, for all the good work you've been doing. And this is me, CJ, your host, Sh- Shining? No. Signing. So this is me, your host, CJ, signing off from the Ship with CJ podcast. Everyone have a great day, a great week, a great lifetime ahead of you. Stay empowered. Be connected. Wait for a minute and a half before you make that choice. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.